It was an intelligence organization. But it did lots of things that I probably didn't know. I mean, they weren't uh, going out in the dead of night from our office and doing their dire deeds. We were just very much aware that it was as secret as you can get, as far as the organization was concerned. And don't ask any questions. I've never regretted going to New York for, and working at BSC. It was being on the fringe of big events. Nineteen forty. The opening months of World War II have been disastrous for the Allied cause. Defeats in Europe have left England standing alone against Nazi aggression. The United States remains neutral. Without American support, it looks as if Britain may fall. In May 1940, Winston Churchill becomes Prime Minister of Britain. He is determined to secure American aid and to eventually bring the U.S. into the war. Churchill really was living on the edge of the blade. Uh, Churchill had told uh, British leaders, um, the United States is like a huge uh, steam engine. Once you get it going, you can't stop it, and it'll win the war for us. But the problem is to get it going. Churchill turns to William Stevenson, a Canadian industrialist living in Britain. He appoints him head of a top secret arm of British intelligence located in New York City. Eventually called British Security Coordination, it will play a key role in bolstering American support for the war and will aid in the establishment of an American intelligence service, now the CIA. Over the course of the war, BSC will grow into a massive operation responsible for intelligence gathering across the entire Western Hemisphere. Stevenson arrived in the summer of 1940 in New York. The first people he approached were his friends. Tommy Drewbrook, a friend from the First World War, was a Toronto stockbroker. He helped recruit people. A.J. Taylor, who was from the West Coast, friends telling friends. And that's how it grew. So British security coordination, even though it was called British, was run by Stevenson and, and staffed by Canadians. The majority of the Canadians hired by BSC are young women. As many as 800 of them come to New York from towns and cities across Canada. All are sworn to secrecy upon arrival. Now, more than 50 years later, the secrets of eight of these women are finally being revealed. Well, I was born in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan in 1913, and went to the University of Saskatchewan and graduated with a BA degree in 1934. And then I went to uh, business and secretarial college. I didn't want to uh, be a teacher, and uh, there just wasn't much for women in those days. With the Depression easing in the East, many prairie people migrate to Toronto. Patsy Sullivan joins them, finding a job with Oxford University Press. When war comes in 1939, she is like many young Canadians anxious to do what she can for king and country. 
most of us thought we were going to get into something, if we could. Britain, with her empire around her, carried the weight of the war alone for a whole long year through the darkest part of the valley. She is growing stronger every day. All our chaps joined up immediately. Everybody, all the men simply vanished. So it was a female world. Thousands of Canadian women heed the call. Factories offer war work, building planes, munitions, ships. For others, there is nursing or the Canadian Women's Army Corps. Confidential work. Confidential work exists elsewhere, too. In 1940, BSC begins placing ads in several Canadian newspapers looking for reliable young women to come to New York City to work for the British government. Oh, I thought that's for me, yes. I thought that would be just terrific. So uh, I showed it to my friend Enid, with whom I shared an apartment. So we applied, and in due course, we were both interviewed, uh, both separately and also together, by Tommy Drewbrook. He got in touch with New York and uh, phoned me at the office and uh, asked me if I would come and have tea with his wife and himself. And uh, so I went on my best bib and tucker. Uh, my best behavior, and he told me then that they would have a position for me in the code, doing code ciphers. Well, my family had a had a friend, Mr. A.J. Taylor, who was uh, involved with Mr. Stevenson for many years in other projects, and his daughter was living in New York, and uh, uh, they thought that maybe I might. Uh, go down eventually, but they sent me to Washington first. And I lived in Washington for three months. I think probably I was under observation before I was sent up to New York. I was recruited in Winnipeg uh, following an, an advertisement in the Winnipeg Free Press. I really didn't tell my parents when I was going down there because I didn't think maybe they would like the idea that I was going down to a hotel to be interviewed. And we're interviewed by Captain Herb Rowland. It was a very low key interview. He said I would be contacted by a Mrs. Shakespeare of the RCMP and she called and I met with her. I was fingerprinted and signed the official Secret Service Act. It started because I wanted a job in Toronto. The interview with Mr. Rowland was held in a, a broker's office, and I later learned that the brokerage was um, somebody that, Mr., that Sir William Stevenson knew and uh, could trust. And, uh, but Mr. Rowland was given a room at the back, and. Um, uh, it was just a little wee cubby hole. I began to wonder what I was getting into. I was recruited through a friend. I had a friend called Margaret Mowen, who was working in BSC at the time. This was in 1941. And she said, would you like to come to New York to work? And I thought that sounded like a very good idea. So I said, yes, I'd love to. The, the RCMP uh, vetted everybody that was going to go to New York, and uh, the one thing that they worried about was that my mother was a member of the Oxford Group, which was a pacifist organization, and so that was the only black mark on my name, but I could prove that I wasn't a member, so. I remember my father saying, why don't you just go to Toronto if you want to 
try your wings, and I said, why would I go to Toronto? I'm perfectly happy in Winnipeg, but I'll go to New York if I get the opportunity. Mother said immediately, well, go for it. <laughs> and he, she thought that should be a challenge. It started out, you know, this whole business as a British passport control office, a scruffy little office in uh, off of Wall Street. And Stevenson used his own money, uh, rented out two floors in the very prestigious Rockefeller Center, paid for most of that out of his own pocket, and created a working environment that looked like it was something very successful. Stevenson was the ultimate insider. He was a successful businessman who had contacts all over the world. He had a lot of American friends. Before Pearl Harbor, in a way, the most important thing that could be done was to win the United States over to intervention. And, and BSC, to some degree, was a propaganda organization using contacts in intelligence uh, to reach people of influence and, and to get them uh, convinced that the war could be won with Britain. BSC's first task is to get critical resources to a beleaguered Britain. It covertly lobbies influential Americans to gain their support of deals that bring much needed war material to the Allied cause. America steps closer to war. BSC probably played, I, I would say, the decisive role in bringing the United States, and particularly the Roosevelt administration, to a determination to do everything uh, to help Britain win the war, and that, in turn, uh, probably did win World War II. To new recruits, BSC is a secret of which they will be told little. We had an address to uh, where we should go, and when we got to the numbered room, there was a guard on the door. He looked at our identities and our cards and so on, and you couldn't get past this guard. Nor could you see from any other place that this door existed. In the front hall, at the other side of the elevator, was a British passport office. So everybody coming off an elevator would turn to the passport office, and nobody would see this other door, which was hidden in the back. Our office was at 635th Avenue, Rockefeller Center, on the mezzanine floor. And for anyone who's been in 635th Avenue, as you walk in, there are massive escalators to the mezzanine. We were told to go to this unmarked door, which we did, and you opened that door, it looked like a stationary warehouse. And sitting there was a, 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 a man who was a plain-closed RCMP. And we were trained in the, the so-called skill of opening mail or other things secretly. They had to take a separate room for us somewhere else to do the training, and believe it or not, one of the first things we learned was how to open a seal. The sealed envelope, like a legal document. The um, training went on for quite some time, and our work was secret even to the other people working there. I didn't realize what it was all about until I got down there, and then I had to sign the Official Secrets Act. And I gradually, when I started working there, became aware of what it was all about. So I went straight into the code, code and cipher room. It was a very small room with about six or seven people jammed in it. And uh, they were either working with the pen, pencil and paper, or they were pecking away at, at um, little manual typewriters. Well, mostly I was doing coding and ciphering uh, for Mr. Stevenson's uh, confidential uh, correspondence. I was told at some point by Miss Richardson, who was the head of the code room, that I was being transferred to the office of uh, Mr. Stevenson. And uh, so I trotted off. For the women of BSC, it is a blur of paperwork, confidential correspondence, coded messages, filing. They gave us jobs uh, to file papers which were given to us, and they were usually marked how they should be filed. And um, uh, we all 
also learned coding, too. So we were filing and coding clerks. I worked on the communications desk just outside the, you might say, inner sanctum of uh, Stevenson's office. And the messages came to me through a pneumatic tube. And the top secret ones went right through to Mr. Stevenson's office. And otherwise, they would remain in my desk, and then I would um, send the decoded ones to the various men who dealt with that particular subject. BSC maintains files on Axis shipping and Nazi companies operating in the Western Hemisphere. Masses of information are gathered, methodical, detailed work from which intelligence is gleaned. The material that we saw was very interesting. It was all sent in by um, reports on, on people that we were watching and interested in. When the U.S. enters the war in late 1941, BSC takes on a new role. It would appear that BSC had lost a lot of importance after Pearl Harbor. The Americans were being trained. Uh, Americans were an ally. No need for propaganda in the papers. But at the same time, BSC's whole focus changed into the area of communications. Stevenson's second-in-command, Benjamin DeForest Bailey, set up a communication system for Stevenson, connecting Washington, New York, Ottawa, Campex, which is near Toronto, and Britain. He connected up such an efficient system that all the Allies decided they should use it as well. Well, it was a very large office. Uh, the largest part was what we called the TK room and they had a huge staff going around the clock. BSC turns the second floor into a massive communications center. One section operates 105 teleprinters three shifts a day, requiring over 400 people to operate them. BSC's complex communication system becomes the quickest and most secure ever devised. It will carry some of the war's top secrets, including the decryptions of the German cipher machine Enigma. They were kind of like uh, vacuum cleaners of the skies, and thousands, millions of messages were pulled in every month. Intercepted enemy messages go to BSC, where they are quickly collated, encrypted, and sent to the Allied country working to break that code. We must remember that the ability to read the enemy traffic has an enormous impact on war and saves lives. A lot of the key battles were won because we had broken their codes, we knew where they were gonna move their men and their ships, and we were able to put slimmer resources in the right places and to win battles. The women are taught to send coded messages using one-time coding pads and teletype machines. Well, I was just told one morning to get myself down to Lower Manhattan and uh, go to a certain telephone company and uh, to learn about the teletype. So I went and I was uh, doing, I think, probably three quarters of the way through the lesson when there was an urgent phone call from the BSC office. Ms. Richardson said that get up here as fast as you can. The machine is installed and it's working and we don't know what to do with it. So I went back. Fortunately, the lesson was nearly over. The messages came through a central section and when they were headed confidential to WSS or for your eyes only or something like that, they were sent in to the inner office where, where we were, and we decoded them there. There were quite a few confidential messages. There were some from Churchill and other very big names during the war. You were asking about the content of the messages. Well, if I, I, I 
can't remember really now, I and mean, if I did, I certainly wouldn't tell you. <laughs> the commonest code was in which you see referred to most of the time is the one-time pad. You get your number uh, for the word or phrase, and you would put it below a number on the one-time pad. And they had groups of five. And they were typed and put on the teletype. Dorothy Evanson is trained on a special coding machine, known only as the Type X. We operated 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It just became routine for us. Whenever the messages became scrambled, we would get a password and then change the drums so that the messages would come out. We didn't spend much time reading messages. We simply got them, poured them out, and they went to the next division and then up to Sir William. When I first went there, I was uh, an assistant to the secretary of Captain Maidman. One of Major Maidman's jobs was to look after the Canadian ham radio operators that had been hired to go to South America to monitor the radio messages sent by Nazi spies in South America say, from Santiago to Berlin or from Buenos Aires to Hamburg. My biggest job was to help identify the different circuits that they picked up. And we never saw the contents. Everything we saw was in code. Everything they sent up to us was in code. And then we just passed it on to England. I was sent into to Trinidad. And in Trinidad, there were four of us. Mail was vetted outside. The ones that looked suspicious were sent to us. Champery is a method of separating two pieces of paper, like the edge of an envelope, if you like, and you have to see it, you lift it off, and then you have to seal it back again so that it doesn't look as if it's been opened. And you shaved off little bits of the paper on both sides. So you would seal it back very carefully. If any glue came out, you'd have to rip it off quickly with a bit of Kleenex. Upon joining BSC, all women are required to sign the British Official Secrets Act. And that meant, how do we conduct ourselves? So people asked us what we were doing, and they said, you don't say anything about this place, you don't mention it to anybody at all. If you're actually pursued by someone and you needs to know where, where you're working, you say you're on government work. There were different departments, but we never knew what they did, which was uh, the secret of BSC. We were in this little box in the jobs we were doing, and we weren't really uh, able to know what other people were doing because they never told us and we never asked. That was the way we operated. And I, I read about the mezzanine floor and I was not aware that it even existed in the three and a half years I was there. You didn't discuss anything uh, uh, with even your co-employees because they would be doing different kind of work than you would. and. Uh, Nobody knew until I think we started this interview a couple of months ago. I didn't know what some of the other girls did. And we were told, even in our hotel room, um, we should tap the walls first to before if we were talking and see if there was any information that there might be a bug. But I mean, it was very serious. We just did not talk about it. It wasn't too difficult to adapt to that. I think people like having secrets. Not even family members know the true nature of their work. Friends and boyfriends are vetted. Some are not approved. They were very good at watching over us. Um, you know, we had a lot of perks. We had all our, we were paid in cash every Friday. All our doctors and medical dentist bills were all paid. 
the restrictions on us were that we could only live in a certain area of Manhattan. Whenever we were going to do anything, we reported what we were going to do. I was rooming with another Canadian, and we met these two nice American girls, and we decided that we would like to rent an apartment. So we found one and uh, signed a lease and um, thought everything was hunky-dory. Well, about two days later, I was called into the chief security officer's office to ask what this was all about. He told me I could not live with Americans. I might talk in my sleep and do <laughs> let enormous secrets out. I was dating a young man very briefly who was an American of and should have been in the forces, according to them, and also owned a car, which was unheard of in Manhattan because private cars were very few and gas restrictions were on. So I was told to find out exactly what he did. And the night that we went to Long Island to a country club to a dinner dance, on Monday morning I was told it, it would be probably a good idea to stop going out with him, which was fine that that happened. I just didn't go out with him anymore. After the war, Stevenson is dubbed Intrepid, a fitting name for an elusive and fearless man. The first time I saw him, I asked, who was that? And uh, the answer came loud and clear, that was God. He was the most secret man I've ever met. <laughs> and he, Joe Hyde, who was one of the people who taught us, told me one day, I asked, now, what's he look like? I had never seen him. And she said, He's, you've been riding the elevator every day you've been here with him in there. He's the man you don't see. And I tried this once, and it actually does work. If you stand perfectly still and don't look at anybody in the eye, you will vanish. You're a secret. He was like that. He was a very unassuming, rather shy gentleman, small in stature. And uh, you would be in an elevator and never know he was there. And he was very gentlemanly. In that letter from Grace Garner that she, she mentioned, she calls him bossy. I mean, not describing him, just saying, bossy will be back, you know, next week, that sort of thing. And I would say WSS or his names, you know, if you're just talking amongst yourselves. She never mentioned him to anybody else anywhere. Stevenson appeared at the door of the elevator and got in. And he said, good evening, Miss Dunleavy. And I was astounded that he would know me and he'll know my name. And uh, I was just left me speechless. He just sort of stood there. And we, nobody else was on the elevator. We went down the 36th floor very silently. Bill Stevenson was supposed to have been born January 11th, 1896. He was actually born in Winnipeg January 23rd, 1897. He was actually born William Samuel Closton Stanger. When he was about three years old, his father passed on. His mother was too poor to take care of all the kids. So she ended up giving Bill to her friend, Kristen Stevenson, who lived right beside them. He left school in grade six, eventually decided to join the Canadian forces in World War I. He was gassed in France. He learned to fly. He became a successful RAF pilot, but eventually he was shot down. He was captured by the Germans. Young Captain Stevenson escapes the prisoner of war camp and returns to Winnipeg, where he sets up the first of many business ventures, a company called Franco-British Supply. The business goes bankrupt in two years. He moves to Britain, where by 1923, he is hailed as a leader of industry. It is unclear how he becomes so wealthy so fast, but he does. With interests in wireless communications, airplanes, Shepperton Film Studios, and Press Steel. Work with his companies let him travel all over the world. So he ended up seeing the buildup of Hitler on the continent, and he warned people in England. Some of these reports found their way to Churchill. When Churchill became prime minister in May of 1940, 
He was looking for someone to send to the United States, and Stevenson was chosen. I was sent as a, a personal representative of Winston Churchill, an old friend, and uh, to cover the whole of the Western Hemisphere and uh, to do any job that he thought uh, might be useful in the war effort in that whole area. And, uh, Accolades for Stevenson come at war's end. He is knighted in 1944. The United States awards him the Medal of Merit, the first time this medal is given to a foreigner. J. Edgar Hoover wrote to Stevenson after the war, and he said, when the full story can be told, I'm sure your role will be among the foremost and having brought victory to the United Nations cause. Ian Fleming is quoted as saying, James Bond is a highly romanticized version of the true spy. The real thing is Bill Stevenson. Stevenson's head secretary, Grace Garner, is often regarded as being the model for Miss Moneypenny. Ian Fleming was a frequent visitor to the New York offices. They had the miniature cameras. They had exploding pans. They had suitcase radios. This is where Ian Fleming saw a lot of those things. So many of these women are essentially the first Bond girls. Marion de Chastelaine used to go down to Washington. She had a contact down there, who was an intermediary, I think, uh, to uh, pick up material which uh, a lady spy named Cynthia. Um, she had managed to uh, ingratiate herself with somebody in the uh, French embassy. Well, I was stationed in New York. She was in Washington in the flow of diplomatic life, uh, where she met the gentleman who supplied this information. So I commuted back and forth to Washington, met her in odd places, sometimes in her hotel, told her what we needed, cheered her up if she was blue, and then collected what she had for me to get back to New York and then got it back again in a hurry so it could be replaced. The climate of secrecy at BSC is tinged with mystery and sometimes fear. I was on a night shift, I guess I was the only one on, in the code room, and there was somebody in the uh, registry, I think, working at night, so we were the only two people there. But there was a knock on the door, and I uh, didn't know what to do. There was this pistol, we didn't know who owned it or anything about it, but anyway, this other girl took it upon herself to grab the thing and stand there. And uh, it turned out to be just a telegram boy delivering by hand. I acted as uh, somewhat of a courier in my job, and I had to go one day to a Chinese laundry delivering some documents and I never really knew what these documents were about. As everything was secret in the, uh, in the office, some of the men had uh, used an alias, obviously for contacts outside the office. And uh, some of the, there was one case, I think, where two people were using the same alias. And I can still see Miss uh, Richardson muttering to herself after she'd answered the telephone and saying, oh, well, these aliases, why don't they get themselves straightened away? <laughs> it was wonderful. It really was. Me, I'd hardly been out of Toronto, maybe over to Center Island a few times. I hadn't traveled, so it was all very exciting. Well, life was wonderful in New York. Uh, there was a war on, but you really honestly wouldn't know. Um, life went on, and it was wonderful, and we were so thrilled to be there. The uh, musicals were fantastic. Uh, the big band era was on. We saw Frank Sinatra as he started out as a very young man. 
and um, we went to the museums, which are fantastic, and uh, the cloisters, the fish market, the stores. We did go to the odd theater and never forget Oklahoma. I just didn't want to leave that theater ever, ever again. Just seeing New York for the first time and getting around and going to Radio City Music Hall and museums and art galleries and all the places of interest, it was exciting. We would get dressed up and wander through Tiffany's and Cartier's and Bond would tell her as if we were going to buy, never bought a thing. Another great thing was to go down to Klein's. It was like a, a warehouse, secondhand clothing, that sort of thing. And it was bargain, bargain time. And it was absolutely wicked to go down there because to be women pulling clothes on and off and grabbing clothes from other women. You could get a, a labeled dress for next to nothing, but it was a real circus. We were on our own a lot, particularly for a, a person working in uh, Sir William's office because there were too many of us. There was only one person who did the same job that I did, and we had to alternate each other. If you were on a, a shift, you didn't have anybody else around. Such solitary work could at times be unnerving. I would go down into the uh, underground part of Rockefeller Center. Well, after midnight, it's a, a very eerie feeling to be walking along and hearing your own footsteps echoing and wondering if there are other footsteps. Beyond New York beckons an even wider world. BSC has operations in many parts of the hemisphere. Some women opt for work in offices in the Caribbean and Latin America. Well, there was a rumor going around that they were going to open a, an office in Guatemala City. So I thought, I'll volunteer because I wanted to see another part of the world, and Guatemala sounded interesting, even though I had to go and look it up on the map. Others leave BSC altogether, choosing the theater of war in Europe. I saw an ad in, in the uh, New York Times for any British subjects who were living in the States. The British government would pay their way to England to join, join up in England. So then I joined the Red Cross and went overseas driving an ambulance in London and then was sent down to Italy as a welfare officer and we had our own truck and supplies. There were, I was the only female personnel with 3,000 men at one point. That was delightful. I did something which I said I was never going to do in wartime, and that was to get married. So uh, it was an interesting time because we moved all over the states to various airfields and uh, while well, he learned to fly the B-29. And then they went off from uh, Kansas to uh, the Pacific, and their role was to bomb Japan. On the second mission that he went on, he disappeared. And um, well, I came home to Toronto, back to my parents, and, uh, and on I went. I went home on my annual holiday, but I knew that my mother was ill and I knew that my father had taken her to Winnipeg to uh, consult uh, certain doctors there. And while we were there, they diagnosed cancer uh, incurable. And uh, we got her back to Saskatoon, and uh, we had to cope. 
and um, she died towards the end of February. And uh, I went back to New York on, uh, on D-Day, which was in June 1944. Today is victory in Europe's day. Long live the cause of freedom. God save the king. Germany's surrender is greeted in Britain and Canada with unrestrained joy. At BSC, celebrations are tempered by the ongoing war in the Pacific. The time for celebration comes four months later when Japan surrenders at last. The war is over. Parades going up and down Fifth Avenue were tremendous. They went on all day and I think all night as well. When the troops uh, started coming home from Europe, some of the Canadian girls would go down to the boats and it was always early in the morning. We had to get up at about five o'clock to get down there. And uh, we greeted the Canadian soldiers when they got off the boats. It was really quite a joyful occasion to see the boys come back. I felt I was too far away from the world. It was a lovely place, Trinidad, and a perfect climate, swimming and dancing all night and so on. It was, too, it was too good to be true almost. But I began to miss the fact that it was not in North America. So I asked Stevenson if I could come home, as I call it, and he said yes. In the last couple of months, we were, uh, I suppose, just mopping up because we were still um, a telegraphic communication with the Far East. A lot of telegrams came through that way. It came suddenly, a call. Stevenson said, I want you to go to Ottawa tonight. And I booked into the Shadow Hotel and at night, somebody came, knocked on my door, and said, we are ready. It was very secret of the whole thing. And there was an, a big room with 10 wrapped parcels, big, great big ones. And when I had all my equipment ready, then I was unwrapping these parcels one by one, and heavy they were, needed two people at least. And there were, they were, each parcel was wound round and round and round with black and brown sticky paper. Of course, there was a guy outside waiting to read these documents. And he was becoming very impatient with the delay. <laughs> he kept sending me these messages, why can't you, you know, speed it up and get going? I could see who they were for, Dr. Nun May. I didn't know what was in them. There was all sorts of scribbles and so on. And later I heard that Nun May had gone to prison. Some of the girls stayed in New York. One of them worked for a big advertising agency, he had a wonderful career, but I wanted to get back to Canada. Patsy Sullivan leaves intelligence work behind her in the fall of 1945. She moves to Victoria, British Columbia, and finds work at a small but growing college that will one day be the University of Victoria. I had a telephone call, would I please go up and be interviewed? So I did, and I was hired, but for two years only. But I stayed for 27. <laughs> I still don't talk about it unless somebody asks me about it. I just uh, said I worked for the British government. These women stayed quiet for 50 years. They didn't even tell their husbands quite often what type of work they were doing. In the intelligence trade, uh, there is no higher tribute than to say they keep their secrets. Going down to New York and working with the BSC did change my life. I grew up, I became more uh, 
uh, aware of what was going on in the world and more interested in everything that was going on in the world. It's been very interesting. I really admired Sir William Stevenson and all the people that I met that were involved. Joining a group of that type was uh, quite a, an experience and gradually learning, you know, how the operation worked and uh, who the people were. And so many of them, I never had any idea what they did. These were executive uh, women of great ability on their own right. They didn't claim the fame, but they did some very valuable work. In the more than half century that has followed since World War II, the story of BSC has been obscured by inaccurate histories and the official Secrets Act. Fiercely loyal to Sir William, the women of BSC remained silent. It is only after his death in 1989 that some women finally speak publicly, shedding new light on the organization. But their contribution remains unrecognized in most histories of the war. It is as if they never existed, but they did exist, and dozens still do. These Canadian women of British security coordination. Yeah.